All right, good afternoon. I'd like to call to order the March 2nd, 2023 meeting of the Monroe County Election Board. First thing on the agenda is old business. Um, has everyone had a, an opportunity to review the minutes from February's meeting? Yes, sir. Yeah. Do we have a motion to approve? I will make a motion to approve the minutes from both the February 2nd, 2023 meeting and the February 9th, 2023 meeting. Thank you for that. Second. Let me call the roll. Sub turned on. Uh, board member Garlitz? Yes. Board member Henry? Yes. Clerk Brown? Yes. Unanimous. All right, under new business, we have updates from voter registration slash election central and Clerk Brown. I have a couple of um, things to share. The first is that we receive a list, a random list of um, pieces of voting equipment from VSTOP, that is the Secretary of State's vendor um, who oversees voting equipment. We have received that random list um, to where they choose a percentage of our equipment um, and that is what will be tested in the public testing to prove that our equipment is where it needs to be. And I have so many papers, I'm gonna ask you for just a minute while I find that or I'll return back to it. Um, but we do have that list of, uh, of equipment for particular polling sites that was selected and it will be um, tested. That testing will be noticed, publicly noticed and is open to the public. Um, and then I also have a couple of dates. Um, March 18th is the date for ballots to be sent out to those who have requested ballots to be sent by mail. April 3rd is the last day that you can register to vote prior if you want to vote in this election coming up. And then of course, April 4th is the first day of early voting. Um, we will repeat those dates again at the April meeting, but I wanted to uh, make sure to say those in this month's meeting as well. And that is what I have for the announcements, but I may circle back when I find my list of where those sites for the equipment that will be tested comes from. Thank you, anything from voter registration? Okay. Appreciate that. Moving on, uh, next item on the agenda is a late CFA-4 that, <laughs> excuse me, we need to review. Um, this one we actually, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we took a vote on this one last time with the understanding that it was first offense, um, but a letter has since been provided, letter of explanation. So I don't think there's any action we need to take, um, but the letter has been provided. So this is along the same lines of what happened how we have proceeded with all other uh, first time offenders, unless- Correct, um, the, the only thing that I was going to say is that I have his file here and I do have a copy within the file that he uh, did turn it in and that it, he marked it as final disbanding the committee. So um, the committee to, or for Gunther for city council has been disbanded. Any comment? I have no comment. Okay. So I don't think we need to take any action on that, um, but it's just for the record there. May I circle back and let you know that yes. the equipment that will be tested is for Ben, excuse me, Benford, Ellisville Christian Church, and the Eastview Church. Th those are the pieces of equipment that'll be tested um, in the public testing that was picked by VSTOP. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on to the next section. Next item on the agenda, we have public comment. Uh, we will take a moment to check online to see if there are any folks on the Zoom meeting that would uh, like to speak. Please use the raise hand function. Or if there are any folks in the audience that would like to speak, please come up to the podium, uh, sign in, state your name, and you are welcome to speak. Do you want to refer to defer to the Zoom? Any? Were there any Zoom hands? We don't see anything. All right. Good afternoon. Hey there. 
William Ellis, and I'll pass out just kind of reminders to the board. I sent an email to all of them previously with more detailed information of the full article. Um, if the public wants to know, we can read that. Thank you. Again, my name is William Ellis, and I want to thank the board for hearing me. Uh, I know that the challenge period is over for challenging any uh, candidates that uh, have issues or whatever, but I'm actually wanting to open the election board to see what they can do uh, and make a complaint based on this article from the Indiana Daily Student, and I think it needs to be investigated and find out exactly uh, whether it's true or not, they're alleging that city council candidate David Wolf Bender running in District 6 does not live where he says he lives. They interviewed um, neighbors and the residents of the property. They're not aware of him. And if he did misrepresent his address, it definitely, uh, I think it's a level six felony in Indiana code. That's not something I know the election board prosecutes, but they can refer it. But I think that just for clarity and confidence in our elected officials and those running, that we have to get some clarity on this issue. Does he, in fact, live where he stated on his uh, filing? Or really just to make sure that people are confident that we are doing our jobs and making sure that our candidates are the best people, not only for what the position they're running for, but also when it comes to personal integrity and represents things they make. And I would believe David Wolf Bender would want to clear that up too, because that's not a cloud you'd want under your, over your campaign. Thank you. Any questions or anything for me? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, for the record, I just want to note that Mr. Ellis did send in a complaint via email, a written complaint on February 22nd as well um, that was addressed to the full board. So we do have that and thank you for coming in today and, and reiterating that. Um, are there any other folks that wish to speak? Okay, um, being that there was a complaint on February 22nd, we did uh, put on the agenda um, an Indiana Code 3-6-5-31 complaint that we do need to address as a board. Uh, we have received counsel from our uh, board attorney, and there is a process for these complaints. Um, I think it is important to note, as Mr. Ellis did, that the challenge period is up, which would um, allow the board and or uh, legal action to remove a candidate's name from the ballot. We are past that point. Um, this is a different type of complaint, uh, literally the word complaint, that needs to be addressed through a hearing. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, the board does have certain powers if we wish to move forward that we can discuss later. Uh, but I think it is important for us to have this, this discussion in a public setting um, based on the evidence at hand. I have uh, provided to the fellow board members some uh, information uh, regarding this matter from both the owner of the property in question and the current tenants of the property in question. Um, we can discuss that if we need to, but uh, according to our guidance, I think the very first thing that we need to do is decide whether or not uh, the evidence at hand, uh, article, folks speaking to the matter, the complaint itself have merit, and if we need to move on to a hearing, which would be set for a later time. Uh, so first, I'd like to open it up to discussion, and then after that, I would entertain a motion uh, to move to a hearing. If I may, uh, Mr. President, thank you. Um, and I want to thank uh, Mr. Ellis for coming today to uh, put words to um, an article uh, that he observed in the Daily Student um, on campus. Um, I think there are a lot of things we have to talk about. 
uh, today. And so I want to make sure we make reference to other evidence that that is read in. So I guess my first comment uh, back to the president as a port of order, are you willing to read in the documents you just put before the board here, not five minutes before we started? Yeah, absolutely. If you want me to do that now. Yep, thank you. Okay. <laughs> I have uh, email correspondence from both the tenants um, of 304 East 16th and the owner. Um, owner says, I have no knowledge of David Wolf Bender living at 304 East 16th now or in the future. Uh, that signed his name, and I have uh, provided that to both. And then I actually, um, from the one of the current tenants, there are three, uh, forwarded their lease to me and put a note that said, thanks for stopping by yesterday, which I did. I followed up on the article much like the journalist did. And I had no idea that somebody had registered for an election with our address. I have a copy of one of the pages from our lease with the names of the current tenants that prove David Wolf Bender does not live here. Um, they are the current tenants and they have re-signed. Uh, both parties have confirmed that those three gentlemen have re-signed for the 2023-2024 school year. So that is what I have in front of me that I, I did not wish to send via email to the other two members just for clarity. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I'm and thank you for providing some additional information. Um, I, I just want to be clear. You you reached out to the tenants of this location on your own initiative. Absolutely. Okay. Then that was not as a representative of the election board, correct? I was very interested after that article that that uh, someone would potentially do this in seemingly such an open manner. Um, I appreciate that. So I, I know that the public isn't seeing the documents before us here, but uh, this document, the lease agreement that was forwarded to you, doesn't seem to have signatures. Is there, are there fourth and fifth pages to this document? That's the only thing I received. So you have a front page that doesn't have the actual signatures of the parties, and there's, so we don't know if there are additional covenants in the lease agreement that would indicate if a sublease could be executed or anything like that. Is that right? Not to my knowledge, okay. but the owner did provide the same thing that said. Understood. That I got it. Understood. The party um, wasn't uh, a tenant. So, I, I, if I if I may, I just want to be clear. Um, I mean, our job as an election board is to administer an integrity-based and transparent election. I, I think we all agree on that. Um, of course, we have you know, an article was published in a student newspaper uh, that has some information, uh, and it looks like you did some gumshoe work here to validate some of that information. But we did not have names or individuals mentioned in that article. Uh, we, of course, have Mr. Ellis's testimony, and of course, I respect his past service as a board member, uh, that he's been in this chair before and understands uh, the circumstances we have to entertain here, uh, but it is no pining and public comment about an article um, in, in a student paper, right? But having said all that, um, I, I very much would like to get to a place where we could answer some of the questions we have. Uh, there are clearly more questions and answers, but as I understand Indiana Code on this, our job today is to make a determination that would be a finding about whether or not to investigate under code. So we're at the determination phase at the moment, right? Um, I guess I have, I wanna make sure that, you know, the public and we all have the transparency in the record. Um, Molly, I know you're here today. Could you um, explain Indiana 3-6-5-31 to us and what, what the obligations of the board are? Good afternoon, election board. Um, the code section that Mr. Henry just cited um, indicates that if the election board determines that there is a substantial reason to believe an election law violation occurred, um, the election board shall expediently make an investigation. And so because you received a complaint, um, at this point, what the election board would be doing is determining if there's a basis for a substantial reason to believe an election law violation has occurred. And if you affirmatively determine that there is a substantial basis to believe that an election law violation occurred, then you would then move on to um, setting a hearing to further investigate that. At that hearing, you would provide both Mr. Ellis, who is the complainant, and the individual who the complaint is against, so Mr. Bender, um, the opportunity to be heard and with due process. I don't know if that fully answers your question, Mr. Henry. So if you have additional, I will well, try well, to it, further well, elaborate. I appreciate it, Molly. Now it does at least to get the words in the room about what, what the code 
obligates the board to do. Um, and so, the, again, you'd said that uh, the basis of uh, a substantial basis for violation of election law, is that correct? Yes. So if the election board determines that there is a substantial reason to believe an election law violation occurred, it shall expeditiously make an investigation. Okay. And is there any guidance in code about what that investigation um, entails? I mean, is there is there a rules of procedure or something that would suggest how the body reorganizes to conduct said investigation? When you look at the code itself, I do not believe there's such guidance, but there is guidance provided by the Indiana Election Division in the Election Administrative Manual. And I also contacted the election in, uh, Indiana Election Division staff attorney who provided um, some guidance on what that, what that kind of hearing would look like. And um, basically the hearing needs to provide each individual, so the complainant and, the, and Mr. Bender in this case, um, due process and the opportunity to be heard. And the board would be a panel to subpoena? Yes. Um, under the election board's duties, they do have the ability to subpoena and administer an oath to the individual who would then respond from to yes. the subpoena. Mr. President, sorry for the grilling. I just want to make sure we understand the process. But um, I do have, may I add something? Sure, of quick? course. Yeah. Molly, if you if you would, I think there's a uh, we need to delineate between investigation and hearing. I think there's uh, that may be part of Mr. Henry's question, and it certainly is mine. Uh, I understand full well what the hearing needs to look like, but what leads up to the hearing? I think the hearing would be the investigation so in essence. One in the same. Yes, because um, you would have the ability to subpoena people who would then present evidence at the hearing, which would constitute your investigation. So then what does it look like for us in the meantime? Um, because it is potential litigation and it is discussing thing, you know, many things on how we may subpoena, who we may subpoena, so on and so forth. Do we need to have an executive with you to determine who that is? Do we have uh, an additional public meeting uh, prior to a hearing? How does that, what does that look like? I would have to look um, off the top of my head. I do not think that this would qualify for an executive session. And so I think the, public or I think the election board would have to decide at a public meeting to have the investigation and then I would imagine that entails who and who and when the hearing who you would like to subpoena and when the hearing would take place and you would have to set the hearing with the ability to issue those subpoenas which in the election code it says the subpoenas are issued by the sheriff's department and I don't know um, how quickly or what their process is for getting the subpoenas out. I don't know if they have a time frame. So, again, thank you for the clarity, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. President, if I may. Um, if, if for some reason the um, the candidate withdrew, would we still have to go through the academic exercise of holding an investigation, or does that does that interrupt the process? Um, I can look into that. I don't know what would happen if the candidate withdrew at this point. May I? The candidate's name will not come off of the ballot, yes, certainly. as I understand it. Correct. Um, and so I I guess my thoughts are, um, at best, we can set a hearing today, correct, that we, we received a complaint, which merits a hearing. I My thoughts are... How, if if the very basis of the complaint is that he doesn't live where he says he lives, how would we subpoena. subpoena and have the sheriff serve a person that we don't have an address for? Then do you do public notice, like newspaper publishing? Um, That's a wonderful question that I think Wally well, might be able to answer. I'm sorry, I missed that question as I was consulting with Ms. Martin. If if we don't have, if, if the very basis of the complaint is an address issue, how might a sheriff serve someone at, a, at an address that perhaps isn't the residence of the person trying to be served? And if that cannot be served, what other ways might suffice as service? I would look into the trial rules to um, determine a subpoena 
um, requirements if an address is unknown. I think if for the, the person who the complaint is alleged, that's an issue that we'll have to work through. If the election board is wishing to subpoena other individuals, then the sheriff could serve those at an address if we knew their address. And um, I'm brief, I'm looking at the withdraw um, statutes right now. I'm trying to, okay, so it says, there's a deadline to withdraw and that's um, anytime not later than noon, 81 days before the set for holding the primary election. So given that deadline, I don't know that this candidate could withdraw. We might be past the time for which he could do so. You're absolutely past the time. Well, a candidate could withdraw at any time for a thousand reasons. A candidate, candidate uh, could pass away, right? I mean, that doesn't that doesn't mean that their name would be removed off the ballot, but a candidate on their own volition could redraw, withdraw, or do whatever they they can they can move to Timbuktu. Why Tree, couldn't Tree, they? did you want to make a statement? Yeah, why couldn't they? Effect? She's got to come up here. She's... I'm just saying that may they may may not be able to legally withdraw, but if I if I refuse to serve. And I say that's I'm, different. That's different. Yeah. But so, once your name is on the ballot, you've missed your deadlines. That's what I just said. Yes. Then you, after your name's still on the ballot. Name's still on the ballot. Yes, ma'am. But he can assume not to serve. Yes. So for the record, will you state your name and your role? I'm sorry, there, Tree Martin. See, and then I have, I have another thought. And the, the young gentleman has two addresses. He has a mailing address and then a residential address. So you would have two potential places to subpoena him to. An additional question, I imagine at uh, candidate registration, you probably get a phone number as well, correct? Yes. So perhaps we could call somebody. There's a lot of things we can do. Yes. Okay. If, if, if directed. Thank you. So I have a thought. Um, and, and a lot of these may be better directed to the Indiana Election Division. Um, and we have a spring conference coming up for the clerks of the Southern District. So I'd be happy to take a list of questions with me to ask. Um, now, I don't have to show up in court every day, but you know how there are some types of court cases where even if you don't show up, the person understands or the notice says it can be heard in your absence. I would wonder if that's the case here, if we have done our best to notify and bring that person in via subpoena, and then they can't, won't, or don't show up for a hearing. Could that hearing then be could, could it continue in that person's absence? And I guess I'm asking that publicly because this article appears to have come out, um, published February 17th. It feels to me that if you um, are legitimately who you say you are and live where you say you live, that there has been at least three weeks to come to Election Central with something formal so that we could relay that in response to the complaint. Can I just entertain the board with something? If uh, you, the question about service, I think it would go to evidence that if service can't be maintained at the address of the candidate filing, that should be a flag that that person doesn't live there. Absolutely. I mean, so that would be part of the investigative, that could be part of the investigative process. I do know in a lot of court cases, if service cannot be obtained, then you cannot proceed uh, if, if the, the person can't be notified. So I think it's very clear that we've got to get that question established um, because. I think that's part, yes. Yeah. And I, luckily, there's two addresses, a phone number. But in the article, also, it stated, he stated that, and that wasn't under oath, but. He stated that he had a lease and signed. He just didn't want to present it. And I'm hoping that it's just something that could be presented to the board. You guys could redact any information that's personal, which was concerned with the IDS and with the press, which I completely understand. And it would just settle this. All you would have to do is present the lease. That's all. So I think it, it, um, if there are no other comments, at least just at the 
the uh, matter of whether or not we have sufficient reason to believe a violation occurred, um, I would entertain a motion at this time to move on to the investigative slash hearing session. Um, and then we can discuss, and I have my thoughts on when that should be set for. If we proceed with it, um, that I will communicate if we get to that point. So with that, I, are there any other comments or questions before we entertain a potential motion? Well, yeah, I, I do have a few more comments. Yeah. Uh, I mean, first of all, um, again, I, I'm just looking at, we, we had a lot of discussion there, so we just need to make sure we're clear, clear on what's tran, tran, uh, going on here, right? Um, I presume uh, Mr. Ellis's second comment should just be added to public comment or as part of your complaint because you provided some additional um, observations about the article, right? So if just to be clear, if I'm considering a pile of information and I, I know Mr. Ellis just came back up to the podium, I guess we're going to incorporate that as part of the complaint as a matter of procedure. So uh, what do you, how do you feel about that, Mr. President? I don't have any issue okay. with it. I think so, it's part of the right. article. So, so there was some more um, uh, opining about the article at that point, got it. So the question is, we are making a determination today and we've had a separate conversation from council about some of the ways that that, that investigation could move forward. And it sounds like we need to really do some homework about procedure and powers and what that looks like. I and mean, that's like a separate conversation before we get to, is there a reason to call an investigation, right? So we're at that determination spot. That's why I just wanted some clarity about where we are in our, our process. Having said that, um, I, I think the question is really, can I make a, a determination just off of a article, a opinion about an article, and then a, a part of a lease that you had provided through your own investigation as, as, in your own capacity as a citizen? And, um, and I think the missing factor, obviously, is we do not have the person on the ballot to easily explain away this information one way or another, right? So uh, it's hard to say, yeah, is that a concrete 100%? Yes, I can make a determination on things here. There's a lot of stuff here, and there's a lot of opinion making here, uh, but there is some incomplete information here. So with more questions than answers, I guess I have one more question for council. Is the only remedy to get the answers to that question engaging in, in, in the, what would be the council's uh, understanding of IC 3-6-5-31? Is it only investigatory at that point? If we had a meeting just on the determination and Mr. Wolfbender provided that lease before we went down the path of subpoena, is there an option there? I'm just making sure I understand the options. Molly, does that make sense? Does my question make sense? Thank you. While we wait for determination, may I suggest that we recess from this meeting rather than adjourn so that we can come back together as we have the answer, as we learn more and get the information that we need? Because we, we will want this to be excellent. <laughs> expeditious in nature. Um, that's the fairest thing to all parties um, and the best thing to do so that once any kind of determination is made, um, that we can communicate that to the voting and citizenry in Monroe County. If I, if I may add, uh, uh, Clerk Brown, I I agree. And so again, my process in a public space is we're doing the public work and uh, we deliberate in public. Uh, it's not meant to be anything other than making sure we do this by the book and as transparently as possible because it is a serious conversation. Absolutely. So I, I want to make sure we have all the tools and all the understanding at our disposal before we proceed down a path which has uh, limited options for remedy the farther we go, right? So that's the only reason why I'm drilling down on it today. Um, but I, I appreciate your comment. I agree with your comment. Thank you. Okay, and looking at the statute, um, with there are several other citing sources and case law that I have not read today, but the only remedy referenced in the statute is if is an to make an investigation. And so if the judgment of the board after affording due notice and opportunity for a hearing, a person has engaged in or is about to engage in an act 
or practice that constitutes or will constitute a violation of a provision of this title, so of the election code, um, the board shall take the action it considers appropriate under the circumstances, including referring the matter to either the attorney general or the appropriate appropriate prosecuting attorney. So um, after, if the board forms a substantial reason to believe that an election law violation has occurred, all the, all the statute says is that an investigation occurs. Then it starts referencing the hearing. Without looking at the case law, I don't know that I can say affirmatively or of the opposite that there is any other alternative to an investigation. Thank you, Molly. I mean, it strikes me that the only the, the only step we have with the questions on the table, right, that we have far more questions than answers. And I'm thinking that at this point, um, it, it seems under the code, while I don't necessarily agree with the grammar of, of the way this is written, that a substantial reason to believe a, a violation has occurred, um, that we move to investigation. Um, it sounds like there's no half of a step here unless Tree have some other um, observations. Hi, yes, I'm getting questions from the audience. A candidate nominated in a primary election may file to withdraw by July 17th noon. That's IC code 3-8-7-28. This is after the primary. Okay. Uh, any other questions or comments at this time? No, sir. Do you have anything else, Mr. Henry? I don't. Okay, at this time, uh, looks like the action that we need to take is to decide if uh, substantial reason to believe a violation of election law occurred. Um, and I would entertain a motion at this time based on the complaint uh, article some other pieces of information that, that I've provided the board um, as to whether or not we should move to the hearing stage. I will, for the sake of continuing this discussion, put a motion on the uh, floor to set a hearing and notice of hearing. I think as a point of order, we need to vote whether or not to, I guess, make the, so is the, is the motion so to it's schedule it's a hearing or to vote to vote that we were conducting an investigation on the question? Those are two different things. So are we, are we, I would imagine the motion would be um, to move forward with an investigation on the question, on the complaint, and then to schedule or move forward. With so the I understood that the investigation is the hearing, but I could have misunderstood. I think you're correct, but Molly's right here to answer. I think the motion if would be that um, um, the motion to determine a motion that there is a substantial reason to believe an election law violation occurred to justify moving to a hearing investigation. So if, if the election board, it's calling for a vote to see if the election board believes there's a substantial reason to believe. So then I will rephrase my motion to say that I believe that with the complaint and um, the uh, supplemental paperwork um, that there is, that I have reason to believe that an election law has either been violated or could be violated and would move to set this matter for a hearing at the earliest possible time following the perfection of service to witnesses. That was a lot. We have all that. There's a motion on the table. Do we have a second? Second. Call the roll, please. 
Board Member Garlitz? Yes. Board Member Henry? Yes. Clerk Brown? Yes. Unanimous. All right, with the motion passed, I believe we need to work. Um, I think that it is important first to say, uh, my opinion is that I agree with Clerk Brown. I think that perhaps the best way to move forward uh, currently is to recess so that we might have the opportunity to come back expeditiously, uh, work with council to find out what uh, we need to do. Uh, I do agree with uh, Mr. Henry that we need to do this in a public setting, uh, whether that is uh, calling for subpoenas, working with council, so on and so forth. I don't know what that looks like, but I think that we need to work with our council on that uh, as this is probably a first for all three of us. Absolutely. Um, and I think it is important that we give everyone the opportunity to speak um, and give their side of the story and what might might happen or might not have happened uh, and move forward from there. So with that, uh, the next uh, the, the next official meeting is April 6th, but we uh, I would like to entertain a motion to recess this meeting so that we might have the opportunity to come together quickly uh, to to take part in the next steps here. I will make a motion to recess. Second. Member Garlitz? Yes. Member Henry? Yes. Clark Brown? Yes. Unanimous? Uh, I would like to note that we will communicate when we will be coming back to session and at what time the hearing will be set for uh, in a very, very timely manner and under Indiana code. And um, just as a reminder, if we don't say a date that we're reconvening on a motion to recess, we'll have to do a 48 hour notice. So once that date's um, determined, I can coordinate with Ms. Martin and we'll get the notice of the when the election board is going to reconvene. <laughs> Thank you. This meeting is in recess.